Okay, folks, another great episode of the Ortho Show. You know, we're sticking around with some sports medicine again. Another one of my friends and colleagues, Mark LeBay, is an orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist at Houston, Texas. We have a lot of kindred spirit. He's a private practice guy, but really uh, is very passionate about professional education, sharing the ideas and things that he's learned over the time from the greats that he's worked with, such as Buddy Savoie and Larry Field down in Mississippi. One of the other things that he does exceptionally well is medical device design. He's been involved with industry on the front side of it, but now he's got a really exciting new product coming out, which we can't exactly share yet, but that's going to come out soon. But he really talks about uh, the pathway of coming together to start a new company, getting financing, who are you going to bring on your team? How are you going to bring this all together and then hopefully have a road to success? So this is another great episode. I know you're going to love it. Hashtag follow the fro. From medical media, this is The Ortho Show. Hello world, Dr. Scott Sigmund, your favorite opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon here for another episode of The Ortho Show podcast where everyone knows we bring the best and the best in orthopedics. And today is absolutely no exception. We're bringing on Mark LeBay, who's a dear friend and colleague, who's an orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist out of Houston, Texas. Mark, what a pleasure to have you on, brother. Scott, I appreciate the invite. Uh, this is my first foray into the podcast world, so hopefully I'll, I'll behave myself appropriately. Uh, you're an old man. I see all that gray hair on your beard, man, but we're happy to bring you into the social media world. It's all good. All right. So we always like to start at the beginning, you know, so we know a little, uh, a little canary told us that you're from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So tell us, you know, what was it like growing up in Canada? When did you come to the States? When was it medicine, orthopedics, all that kind of good stuff? So for me, I was born in Calgary. My, my dad's an oil and gas guy. So we're all French Canadian. So we're from Montreal and Quebec area, which is where we call home. And when I was very young, uh, obviously, um, they were in Calgary. I was born there. And then we actually moved around the world. So not much time spent in Canada, actually. I lived in Africa, lived in New York, uh, moved down to this area just north of Houston in spring in 1978. So, uh, but still got to experience the North. So hockey was my first sport, picked up uh, baseball, soccer, all that kind of stuff there. And then obviously when I moved to Houston, hockey uh, kind of went away, unfortunately. So for Canadian, that was, that was really tough. Uh, but picked up football and eventually rugby, et cetera. You know, medicine for me, uh, eight years old, I remember I was, uh, my, I was sitting in the, in the passenger seat because you could do that back in, you know, 1979. Uh, I may or may not have had a seatbelt on, you never know. Uh, and I remember looking at my dad and saying, you know, I, I want to be a doctor. And uh, he looked at me, you know, what do you, what do you tell your eight-year-old, uh, you know, when he says he wants to be a doctor? All right, good. And then you probably forget about it for the next 20 years. Um, but the, you know, the thought never left me. And so, um, grew up wanting to be a heart surgeon, actually. Were there, uh, were there doctors in the family or, I mean, where did, where did this come from? No doctors, no doctors for generations. Just one of those things that just kind of struck me right there, right in front of my elementary school, we were going down the road. I was like, yep, yeah, I want to be a doctor. So going through high school, enjoyed the sciences, uh, did a lot of extra sciences. Um, and then, uh, on a, on a lark, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. Um, still wanted to be a doctor and really committed to this. Uh, in high school, I uh, applied to the Johns Hopkins University. And so, <laughs> you know, at that time, you want to be a doctor, that was a place to go. I said, shoot, that's where I'm going to go. So uh, they actually let me in uh, from a Texas public high school to the Johns Hopkins University, where all of my friends came from the Northeast, your neck of the woods, New York, Boston, Jersey, uh, they all had AP credits. You know, I was uh, I was from nowhere, you know, spring, Texas, uh, but made it up there, played football, played rugby, stuck it out, still wanted to be a heart surgeon. And then in medical school at Baylor, went, went back there for med school, um, got a lecture from a guy named Bill Bryan. Bill is still in practice. He is the former team doc for the Astros, uh, works at Houston Methodist and gave us a lecture on sports medicine and offered kindly to, uh, to allow us to spend some time with him in the operating room. And I had done a rotation. I was 19, 20 uh, years old. This was the summertime. I did a rotation uh, with uh, Denton Cooley, actually. It's a 
world famous, you know, guru of heart surgery, uh, DeBakey Cooley fame. And I was also, assisting- also, also traded Hopkins, right? Wasn't he one of the Hopkins, you know, cardiothoracic surgeons? I'm, there's a cool movie about so the, 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 the intern guy who sort of helped out. But yeah, no, keep going. It's all good. You're 100% right. Also trained at Hopkins. And so uh, I actually got to first assist him in a carotid. And uh, we talked about Johns Hopkins. Turns out that he um, had financed the um, the gym that I used to work out in. <laughs> he donated some money so I could have a That's gym awesome. when I was playing football. Yeah. I know. So, um, uh, so but, hold on. Let's 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 go back to Hopkins for a sec because all right. We've yeah. got some we've got some common ground there. I mean, I grew up in Baltimore. So, right. you know, that's that's where I spent my time. One of my partners, you know, and uh, you played football too at Hopkins, didn't you? That's right. Yeah, so one of my partners, Mark Lapp, overlapped you maybe by like a year. I may have asked you this at one point or another. I think he played safety, but he was there. Uh, I'm trying to think. I'm looking here. You were there 89 to 93. Mark was probably there a couple years before you, so maybe there was a little overlap, but that doesn't sound familiar to you. No, it doesn't sound familiar. So I, when I was there, I played uh, I played linebacker. I was on defense. So I would have I would have known him because, uh, I mean, I, I ended up starting my uh, sophomore year, and so um, I don't remember that name, Mark Lapp. No. The, the other question I have for you is, where is your Texas accent? Uh, you know, having lived around the world, uh, my first language being French, my second language then being the uh, local African dialect because I was two, three years old at the time. Um, you know, one of those things that I never really picked up a Texas accent, unless, of course, I go to Quebec, and then all my family there says, you sound like a Texan. And then uh, when I speak to anybody around me here, they're like, you're from the north, aren't you? So I, I think I think it <laughs> do, depends on your perspective. <laughs> do, do you, uh, can you still speak French fluently? Oh, ben oui, je parle français. Uh, je ne pas le fro, but the le fro doesn't count, but that's okay. It right. doesn't translate, but that's all I got. <laughs> but, but that's awesome. I love it. Um, yeah. All right. So, so then, all right. So you're at Hopkins, you do your thing, which is like this, this sort of crazy world in which all every kid there wants to go to medical school. They figure we're going to go to Hopkins and, you know, maybe I'll get into Hopkins medical school, which is even more ridiculously difficult, but you head back down to Houston, uh, to your roots at that point, you're doing this whole thing, you're working out, you got the whole cardiothoracic thing, you're doing a carotid. So when does orthopedics pop into the world? So orthopedics pops in, um, Really when, so I, I decided, you know what, I'm going to take this guy, Bill Bryan, up on his uh, on his offer. And so I cut class one day, go operate with Bill. You know, turns out this class I'm cutting, they just read you the syllabus. Well, I'm, you know, I can read by this point. So I cut class, go operate with Bill Bryan. Turns out Bill Bryan is an alum. So he went to Johns Hopkins and a fraternity brother. So good guy to hang with on every Tuesday or whatever day of the week it was. So I just start constantly cutting class as far as that day of the week and go operate with him. And I quickly realized, you know what, this orthopedic stuff, sports medicine stuff specifically, that's it for me. I mean, that's that's where I want to be. I fit right in. I'm getting my hands in there. I'm doing stuff and uh, and just fall in love with it immediately. So all, all my electives, everything I'm doing in medical school at that point is, is shifting gears headed this way. Four different electives, away rotations at uh, in Michigan, uh, away rotation in Denver, and uh, never never looked back. Took, did my fellowship with uh, with Buddy, obviously, 2002, 2003. Um, and, you know, that was kind of a fluky thing, actually, the the Buddy story. I don't know if you got a minute for that. Yeah, yeah. No, no Larry, Larry Field was there as well at the time, right? The two were there together. Absolutely. Larry and Buddy were there. Uh, yeah, Gene Barrett, Walter Shelton, those were the big four guys there. Uh, two knee, two shoulder, rotated with them. Uh, just a, a fantastic experience. So, so here I am doing orthopedics, uh, actually doing a sports rotation. And Buddy's coming into town to, uh, to do a lab, a lecture lab. Uh, remember, it's at Methodist Hospital. And it's one of these weekends where, you know, in the Houston uh, area, it, as it can do every now and then, it will rain. And it will rain really hard and for a long time. And your car may or may not be there because it might have floated away when it's done raining. And it was one of those kind of rains. And um, if you know anything about Buddy, when Buddy says he's going to be there at that time, he's, he's going to be there. Um, and if, if he has to swim, if he has to kayak in there. Um, and so I had been invited just to listen to the lecture because, you know, these labs, they're, they're expensive. And so I was not anticipating doing a lab. And so I show up. Uh, Buddy, of course, shows up and probably one third of the expected participants show up to do this lab. So I listened to the lecture. Fantastic experience. And I'm about to walk out. And, you know, the 
the reps, the guys there look at me and they say, look, we're, we got all this stuff. We've got all this cadaver stuff to do. Two thirds of the people didn't show up. Why don't you come on down to the labs? So, you know, I'm kid in a candy store at this point. How, how old are you at this point? So I'm in, uh, I'm in residency. Okay. Uh, so I'm, you know, third year resident looking to do sports medicine, you know, have scoped, awesome. a, scoped a couple of things. So I'm in the lab and kind of grinding my way through whatever. I don't know if I'm in the cuff. I don't know if I'm, you know, I don't know what I'm chewing up here, but I'm doing something. And apparently Buddy finds it interesting because he comes over and talks to me and he probably spends a good hour, uh, you know, telling me what's going on. I got this little, you know, fellowship in Mississippi. Uh, I had no idea who he was. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> didn't have a clue. Well, that's just, that's who Buddy is though. He's such a sweet yeah. guy, you know, he'll yeah. just hang out with you and talk. And next thing you know, you're getting like this mini fellowship with like one of the country's great sports medicine specialists. I, it's exactly what happened. I, I had no idea what was going on. And, uh, and so of course I leave that experience just totally enthralled with this guy. He was like, yeah, you ought to check us out. And so I go look in the book because at that time you, it was a book. There was no online. This is yep. your fellowship. I look in the book and I look it up and I'm like, son of a gun. That's exactly where I need to go. Uh, and so I, I remember I went home to my wife that day and I looked her in the eye and I said, you know what, babe, we gotta, we gotta move to Jackson, Mississippi. And she, she looked at me <laughs> like, like I grew a third head, you know I mean? <laughs> oh, I but, love it. Yeah, but I applied and uh, and got in. So what this does he remember the story? I mean, was during the interview? Did you talk about it? Of course, he totally remember. You know, buddy, he doesn't forget things like that. So yeah, that was that was a big topic of conversation, and uh, and so they offered me the first spot. You know, that year I started two thousand two, two thousand three, and uh, shoot, what a what an experience working with those guys, and uh, saw all kinds of stuff. I mean, I, you know, when they they said that we would do, you know, maybe you know, 15 cases a week, maybe 20 cases a week. I thought, what the heck am I going to be operating on that much? But I mean, it was legit. It was not, you know, scope, subacromial decompressions. This was rotator cuff repairs, ACLs, uh, meniscus repair. I mean, just everything did some knee arthroplasty and huge volume and, and got to work with Buddy literally the entire time. So when, at the time when he was there, you did your rotation with him, but even when you're on a rotation with somebody else, you got a day a week with Buddy. So I was I was in the buddy world the whole time. That's awesome. Did you go to the wedding by any chance? Because he was just there. I don't know if you saw, there was a picture of, of like the great icons of shoulder and sports medicine, all at Buddy's daughter's wedding that was down in New Orleans this past uh, week or two. Dave Hook had sent out a bunch of pictures to everybody. No, that's awesome. No, I didn't make it to the wedding, but uh, um, but still very fortunate to consider all of those guys, uh, you know, still friends, still keep in contact with Larry, still keep in contact with Buddy learned a tremendous amount from, uh, from all of those guys. And, um, and, and it really kind of opened my brain because they really were sometimes so far outside of what was considered the box at that time, uh, doing different procedures. I remember I did a, a coracoacromial arch reconstruction. So shoulder escape and this horrible anatomic deformity. And buddy's like, Hey, we're just going to, we're just going to put this here and put that there. And it just blew my mind, you know, that we did this, something that, you know, I hadn't even heard of before. And here we were doing it in fellowship, but really expanded my, my mind as far as what was possible. Uh, we were putting grafts on glenoids because at that time we had all of this arthritis that was coming on because of the pain pumps and shoulders and the, and burning a capsule when we thought that would help stabilize shoulders. And so a lot of, a lot of cool things and a lot of, um, a lot of people coming in, different companies, bringing their devices in. Hey, check this out. Check that out. What do you think? Um, and so that's, you know, that's what really uh, interested me in, in sort of the, the icing on the cake for orthopedics for me. You know, this, this innovative uh, technique, tool development. So I, I love the day to day, but I love the icing, too. Yeah, no, and I think that that's a that's a great uh, story for our listeners out there because we love mentorship on the Ortho Show, and you couldn't have asked for a better mentor than Buddy Savoy, uh, you know. Uh, so, I mean, Buddy's now the the current president of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. He has, of course, the the head team position at Tulane with Mike O'Brien. Congratulations to the Tulane football team. Right. They, had, they had an amazing year. Go figure, right? Go Green, Green Wave, whatever they are. But you know, congratulations to those guys as well. And then hey, I love all this. My yeah. oldest son is graduating from there. Oh, that's fantastic. So you know all he's, about it then. I know all about it. He's, gradu he's graduating in May. We were glued to the TV watching that game. It was amazing. 
crazy two lanes at like at the level that they are fantastic but i still love how you you know you maintain your relationships and you can still talk about cases you know complex cases because there's always stuff that rolls in that you're really not sure about it's always nice to have other people to, to gain consensus like i said you know we have this saying in orthopedics and it certainly holds true in other places that we're standing on the shoulders of giants and so it's you know my interest and in, and in the things that really leapfrog me into into developing tools and techniques, et cetera, because of what I learned, uh, you know, from Buddy, from Larry, from Gene and Walter, you know, when, when it came time to join societies or whatever, these guys always had their hand down to me to kind of pull me up and bring me along and say, hey, you should try uh, teaching in the OLC. You should try uh, running this course over here. Um, and, you know, even when it came time to, uh, to look at, uh, you know, what then was Rotation Medical, now Regenitin, uh, I got an email um, uh, looking for my interest in that particular product. Why? Because because Buddy had included my name in the list of people that uh, you know that should be considered in, in looking at this kind of stuff. So, you know, these guys as uh, as mentors have been absolutely invaluable to me, and I, I just couldn't ever thank them enough. So let's talk. We have some, we have a couple of things that are in common. You know, we're both in private practice, but yet you know really sort of feel compelled to be a part of the larger sort of group of orthopedic surgeons in the world and and not just stay within our little villages and operate on people, but, you know, be a part of a larger process. So, you know, there's a few things. So for our listeners in particular, you know, professional education has been important for you too, to be able to pass on the things that you've learned, whether it's through ANA or the OLC or working with industry through industry sponsored professional education. What's your draw there? Why is that a passion for you? Well, you know, there's a lot of different facets to what you can do and be as an orthopedic surgeon. And one of the things I think that's really important is, is being a teacher. And so obviously somebody taught me, somebody taught you, and uh, I was uh, the wonderful recipient of all of this knowledge and experience from these guys that we just mentioned. And uh, I'd like to think I've tried to take it to the next level and continue to learn from other people who've taken it to the next level, like yourself and others. And why not, you know, take the opportunity to uh, to go and impart the knowledge and, and teach these physical skills, teach the mental skills as far as evaluation. I mean, what, what better thing to, you know, to do than to pass this on? Uh, you know, a long time ago, I mean, when I, when I was a kid, I mean, this was something my dad said. He said, you should leave the earth a little bit better place. Yeah. So I mean, that's I, how you do it. You just, that, you know, you just leave a bit of that behind of what you've learned and gained and done. And if you can do that, that's a life well lived. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, we've we've really had the honor of, of working with incredible people. We've uh, mastered techniques and knowledge, and it would be such a waste not to, not to pass it on. And so uh, just like, you know, you had mentors and I had mentors with Dr. Job, et cetera. Uh, it's amazing to try and identify and be able to help others in the same way. So really well said. Another thing that that is a great passion for you um, is that, you're, you're always looking to come up with really cool, good new ideas. And it shouldn't be yeah. just what we've done in the past, but what can we develop with medical device design, for example, that can you know be able to help people to, to do things just a little bit better. So we both share in that passion. So where did that come from from you? It sounds like maybe from dad, where does that come from? So really I, I got into that mostly in fellowship. That's where the other companies would come down and they would, you know, hey, look at this, look at that. And then seeing all these innovative techniques that I would get taught from these guys that really sparked the interest there. I, I really didn't have much, I don't want to say I didn't have much interest. I had certainly a lot of interest in the tools and the things in orthopedics, but not interest in developing. But I got taught so many techniques that were outside the box that, um, you know, when it came to seeing my own patients, like uh, in 2002, I did my first arthroscopic rotator cuff graft. And I'd done None of them ever before, but, you know, like many of these kinds of situations, I had a patient, had a bad tear, it fell apart. I was thinking to myself, what the heck could I do? You know, our options were limited back then. And so I thought, well, shoot, I learned to use a graft in a different situation in fellowship. Perhaps I could apply it to this patient. Literally called her up on the phone and said, hey, look, I've got this idea. I think it could work. It could help you. We use this same device and other patients. Um, in a different situation. So I feel like it would be very safe medically. And I worked out the technique on how to do it literally running around Rice University because I used to live down there. And I did it and it worked. And so I just kind of kept advancing that particular technique. And that really, really, you know, kind of got the bug going. And so uh, 
you know, like you, I've, I've worked a lot with industry, uh, got to see some of the things that they were developing. Um, and an, another example is Expresso Auto Capture. It's a, you know, the Auto Capture rotator cuff device. So I remember talking with one of the product reps and um, he was asking me, uh, you know, about rotator cuff repair. And I said, you know what? I only know what I do in the operating room, but you as the product rep get to see what everyone else does in the operating room. Where do you see people struggling with this? And he said, you know what would be good if you, there was a device that you could put a stitch through the tendon. And then when you pulled the device back out, it had the stitch on it. And I said, well, you can do that. And I drew up some quick sketches and sent it into them. So yeah, I mean, great from there. Yeah. I mean, there's, and there's a lot of ways, you know, to do medical device design. You know, there, there are people that go and, sit down and they draw it out and they actually go to a patent office and they actually, you know, get the rights and the trademark, you know, for their idea. And then they'll go and try and identify, you know, sponsors and, and capital to be able to push it through. And that's a pretty arduous process to be able to take a brand new idea all the way through. And I think that what, what's happening now a lot more is sort of a combination effect with industry where you develop an idea together, you actually get a patent together. You may not have complete control of the patent where industry takes it over when it's ready, but tell us about your experience there. Which pathways have you taken to be able to develop devices? So I've done a few different pathways. I've done the, here's a device of yours, and here's the next iteration that I've sort of thought of and how to do it. So I'm not on the patent, but I did get a royalty from that. Still actually get a royalty to this day, a few years later, a little bit of mailbox money doesn't hurt. So that's one pathway. Uh, another pathway is the one you just described. You, you come up with a totally new idea, but you don't want to invest the time. You don't have the engineering skills, uh, you know, the patent attorney, et cetera. And then you bring this idea to the company, work on it together. And of course they get the majority of that and you get whatever percentage you've worked out. And then most recently, and, uh, and, and much like uh, I believe this show for you started in a pandemic, uh, for me, I uh, helped start an orthopedic company. And we went from uh, ideation to product in uh, two years. And so this was a group of surgeons, a group of engineers, uh, we put our money together as founder shares, got some investors, came up with a product idea, uh, developed it, and um, you know, and we're we're about to bring it to market. I mean, literally on the edge of bringing this thing to market, and so uh, it is arduous. And one of the first things that we did, number one, you've got to have partners that you believe in and you trust in, and you have to have faith in these people because uh, you know there's a lot of ways you could potentially hurt each other. So you've got to have a lot of uh, you want everyone to have a lot of integrity, um, which is which is really important. Um, number two is we got a patent attorney in on the ground level. Literally day one, minute one from ideation, uh, the patent attorney was involved and he's actually part very deeply uh, part of the team so that all of this was recorded and, and patented when appropriate. So, uh, so keep going. I mean, this is fascinating. Yeah. I want to, we want to hear more. Yeah. And so uh, we went through the founder's money. We got, uh, you know, we got the idea. Um, on, on the, I say on the cheap, I mean, this was very high level stuff, uh, created prototypes and uh, started testing them in a lab. And so now we have a facility, uh, it's got a lab, we've been testing our product, it tests extremely, extremely well. And uh, we've gone through uh, a second series of funding. Uh, thankfully for us, uh, the funding has gone extremely well, relatively easy. And we've taken this thing now through the steps to bring it to market. Um, so obviously that requires certain approvals, et cetera, testing, uh, sterilization, whatnot. So there's a lot, um, you know, a lot going, uh, a lot to do, but, uh, we're very fortunate and that's our, uh, you know, our main player, uh, running this has, has done a startup before has done medical startup before. So he's got the experience and the wherewithal to do this, understands how to run the budget, understands how to run, uh, the small limited group of people that's required to do this, um, and each of the surgeons have brought their own specific uh, skills and traits to, you know, to create this product. For me, I'm kind of an idea guy. Here's what I think this should do. Uh, we've got another gentleman who's ex excellent. He's almost like a surgeon slash engineer. Um, another doc is, uh, is very well connected people wise. And, and they're, you know, both of them uh, are all extremely skilled as far as surgical hands as well. Uh, but we do things a little bit differently in the operating room. And certainly when you develop a tool like that, you want it to be usable by, you know, different surgeons in different ways. Um, and so it was a, it's, it's a very good team of, uh, 
of very high integrity people who have come together and and uh, so far so good. I mean, it's we're not at the finish line certainly, but uh, but we're we're moving along. Well, I mean, that's awesome. So I'm assuming it's probably going to be a 510k predicate, right? It's not going to be de novo FDA approval. So the process there is going to be relatively okay, straightforward. Yeah, 510K is uh, definitely an easier way to go. Obviously, uh, when you've got a predicate product and, and uh, especially materials wise, you're not creating a brand new material, et cetera, it makes life a lot easier. So, yeah. And I love it. Just to sort of summarize, because it doesn't sound like you want to give up the special sauce yet, which is okay. We understand that. But, you know, coming together with a team, I love the fact that you have engineers and surgeons working together. I think some of the greatest failures in medical design have been when engineers have done it alone without having a John Glenn or a test pilot to be able to identify, you know, how that's really going to work in the operating room. Uh, bringing a patent attorney in early is fantastic. Having a broad spectrum of people across in your team that all have different Differential ideas and concepts, I think, is great. And you know, you've gone through some financing, and uh, at the end of the day, I hope you've kept, you've kept as much equity as you possibly can. And uh, you know, so when do you think we can look forward to hearing more about this product when it's ready to launch? I'm really hoping that uh, you're going to hear about this in the in the coming months, uh, very shortly. Uh, and and depending on what your you know views are about that, then. Uh, you know, be certainly happy to talk about this again uh, in a more public forum like this if it's something you're interested in. But uh, but it's it's going to be really soon. I, I really look forward to exactly hearing uh, what somebody like you know like you thinks about this. It's it's uh, taking a couple of concepts and uh, and sort of flipping our current techniques on their head a little bit. Um, so it'll be cool. Yeah, that's amazing. We'll do one better. We'll have you sponsor some of the Ortho Show podcasts coming up so we can <laughs> amplify your message. And at the end of the day, here's from my mouth to God's ears, you know, one of the big five, because they don't want to do any more R&D. All the large medical device companies are farming that out. You have, you know, have a wonderful experience. And then one of the big companies comes and brings you under their wings and you get a nice exit strategy. But hey, look, Mark, I, I love talking to you. You know, we're kindred spirits. We have a lot of things that are very similar in our careers. You know, I, I greatly appreciate the fact that you as an orthopedic surgeon in private practice extend beyond your typical scope of just caring for patients, whether it's professional education, medical device design. I think you've given uh, our listeners a really great story. Well, I appreciate it, Scott. Uh, you know, I talk about this stuff all day. It's a, it's certainly a passion of mine. I've enjoyed it for the last 20 years, and I certainly hope to enjoy it for the next 20. I've got a son who thinks he wants to do this, and if, if I have one wish, it's to hang in there long enough that perhaps just maybe we could practice just a little bit together. That'd be cool. Yeah, that's super cool. This is Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro, host of the Ortho Show. Till next time.